Daniel Gilad is a sound engineer and music producer that has been working in the industry for over a decade. Music for me is about creating relationships through sound. Each piece of music has its own personality, quality, and design. It is a reflection of the artist's soul and a small window to their story. Daniel has provided services for live sound, studio production, mixing, and mastering to some of Hawaii's finest artists. It is my job to be able to translate it and shape it to be shared with the world. Traveling the globe has exposed Daniel to a variety of music, cultures, and relationships. He brings this breadth of perspectives and experiences to his craft and has worked in many different genres, including folk, rock, hip hop, world, pop, sound healing, and meditation. Contact Daniel at dgsoundcreations.com to learn more about how he can help you with your next creative project. dgsoundcreations.com for all of your audio production needs. I am pleased and honored to provide post-production services to What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. This podcast is funded by Ted Dintersmith, the executive producer of the acclaimed film Most Likely to Succeed, and the author of the best-selling book What School Could Be. Hey everyone, this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. I am your host, Josh Rapun. This is the 14th episode of season two, and we are stoked to be back on the air, bringing you another bushel of episodes this winter spring of 2021. In the first semester of season two, we brought you a teacher of the year, a Teach for America superhero, a published author, a student climate change activist, and an Eastern seaboard shoreline scientist educator, among many other educators and education leaders. In the second semester of season two, we have an incredible lineup of guests, including a student entrepreneur, the founder of PBS Hawaii's Hiki No program, a NASA space enthusiast, an award-winning history teacher, and a husband-wife team from the island of Kauai, among others. Matthew Tom is a teacher and media specialist at Robert Louis Stevenson Middle School in Honolulu, on Oahu. He engages his students in ways I find completely inspiring. He is the faculty advisor for Stevenson's Media Service Organization, which specializes in event photography and producing digital media content for the school. Matthew's program seeks to build and maintain a positive campus culture, excite students about photography and videography, and build student skills in digital media production. Matthew is also the faculty advisor for Tusitala, which is the literary and arts magazine at Stevenson, recently recognized by the National Council of Teachers of English. Tusitala means the teller of tales in Samoan and is the name Samoans gave to Robert Louis Stevenson when he traveled there. Matthew has taught or been an ed tech specialist in Hawaii, Japan, and Washington. His undergraduate in English is from Willamette University. He has a master's in curriculum and teaching from the University of Oregon and is currently in a professional practice doctoral program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Matthew's teacher website is an absolute wonderland of student exhibitions of learning and imaginative curriculums. And now, here's my conversation with Matthew Tom. Matthew Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. So, Matt, right out of the gate... You blew me away by sharing a Padlet you called Mr. Tom's Identity Chart. I got entirely lost wandering around your chart, getting to know the many elements of you, um, and also getting to know Padlet, which is really cool because I'm not that familiar with uh, Padlet technology, which is it's way cool. So who is this Matt Tom, and what are a few of the elements of his identity? 
Uh, first and foremost, I feel like I really enjoy connecting people um, through a variety of clubs, through a variety of events, events that I enjoy putting on. So a lot of this um, stemmed from when I was little, when I was back in elementary school, when I was in Troop 33 at Manoa Elementary School as a Boy Scout, or at that time, I guess it would be a Cub Scout. And so the, the scouting program really changed my life in terms of it allowed me to explore these avenues that um, I, I didn't really think I would be interested in, like hiking and like, you know, camping and all of these different things. And through the, the Boy Scout program, I was able to really explore my leadership abilities, whether it's um, helping younger scouts learn how to set up a tent or whether it's um, helping younger scouts learn how to orient a map or it could be gathering a bunch of people to create an activity or set up a campsite and so through my what would it be like 12 years mm -hmm. In the scouting program, I was able to really explore and refine my vision of what a good leader could and should be. And I'm nowhere near, you know, the best leader in the world. But at the same time, I feel like the scouting program really helps me understand who I am as a person and who I am as a leader as well. Mm. And and it was through the scouting program that I really enjoyed, you know, bringing these different perspectives and bringing these different worldviews together. And that carried me forward into high school and college and beyond. Mm. That's so awesome, Matt. You know, we're, we're going to come back to the scouting question a little bit later um, because I want to dive into that a little bit deeper. But, you know, I, I was never a scout. I'm not sure that any of my uh, five brothers uh, were scouts either, but I lived a, a pretty much a scout existence growing Growing up in Kahulu on the windward side out on Kaneohe Bay. And I think I think our lives were scouting lives. You know, we did all those kinds of activities, um, how to pitch a tent, uh, how to row a boat, you know. Um, <laughs> so I, I can I can totally relate to that. That's very cool. But we'll come back to that. So, you know, back in 2019, you wrote out some thoughts about education I found very moving and would like to use as inspiration for this interview. And you wrote, my students are not just names, not just numbers or test scores or grades, or just breathing bodies in the classroom. So Matt, if, if your students are not just names, uh, not, not numbers and not test scores or breathing bodies, what are they? I articulate my students as collections of stories, collections of memories, and they're, they're there are these lived experiences that, you know, have influenced their lives in various ways. And all too often, students are treated as, you know, just kind of buckets where we have to fill them with information. They move on to grade level, to grade level, to grade level. They have to pass a test and all of that. But, you know, for me, I, I tend to push back against that narrative and really want students to explore what makes them human. I want them to explore what makes them tick, why these stories that have affected them in the past have affected them and how to take these experiences and move forward with them. So given given what you just said then, Matt, it, it makes sense, I think, for our listeners, for you to just tell us, I know I've already done this in the introduction, but like, wh who are you as a teacher? What do you teach? What is your position at Stevenson Middle School? So technically, I'm an English language arts teacher, but I tend to think of myself as someone who helps students tell their stories. And that, to me, is the most important part of teaching, helping students understand where they're from, understanding who they are right now, and understanding how they are going to bring this, this future person into being. And how, you know, all of these influences and how all of these different worldviews and perspectives and experiences all kind of rub up and mingle with each other to make them who they are. 
And so I think as a teacher, it's my responsibility to start that conversation. It's my responsibility to, to bring those ideas to the fore and help these stories that are innately within students come to being because, you know, students and, and humans in general are, are natural storytellers, right? We, we see the world in stories. We talk to each other in terms of stories and schools should be no different. We, we see the world as individuals and the way we see the world is completely different from the person sitting next to us. Mm. And I think that's really, really important to be able to share those perspectives with each other. Mm. But you know, Matt, I'm, I'm not sure it's a given that any or all language arts teachers or even all teachers in general see students as a collection of sort of living, breathing stories or storytellers. Like when on the timeline of your life, did you begin to see that very clearly, that that's the way that you see the students that you are working with? I think it started off in my either sophomore or junior year of college when I took this course called Literature of the Diaspora. Mm. And that was the first time I've ever heard of that word diaspora. Like, what? what is it? What, <laughs> what does it mean? Thing? Yeah. Yeah. And so in its simplest terms, a, a diaspora is, is a group of people who start off in a homeland and they move to a new land in search of either a brighter future or in search of change. And sooner or later in this new land, they start to recreate identities of their, their homeland. And I thought that was really, really interesting and, and captivating because they're either, they're neither here nor there, right? They're neither in the homeland nor are they you know, completely, I guess, natives of, of the, the land that they're moving to. Mm -hmm. And yet they're trying to recreate facets of their homeland. So it's, they're, they're kind of in this hyphenated space. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, I'm, I'm a Japanese American, Japanese hyphen American. And there, there's a lot that happens on that hyphen. There's a lot that happens in that intermediary space that often goes overlooked. Um, there, there's a lot of like messiness that happens in that space. And that's where the story is. Mm. And that, that chorus literature of the diaspora really helped me not necessarily understand, but it helped me dig into that hyphenated space and what you know, complexities are in people's identities. And so from, from that course on is when I started to view not only my students, but started to view people mm. differently. Um, not just, you know, random people moving around, but instead, like, I, I wonder what makes these people tick. What, in, what happened in everybody else's lives that you know, influence them to be behave or become a certain way. And so that that course really kind of changed my my perception of the world. Mm. I'm always amazed, Matt, at, you know, this that when it, when I do these interviews with educators and education leaders, there always seems to be this moment. And oftentimes it's a course or a particular curriculum that somebody experienced under a particular teacher that seems to just sort of take everything in a, in a different direction, right? I mean, it's just, it's so cool how something like that could be so influential for you. Mm -hmm. And you, and you're, you're carrying it with you every day since when you, you were at Willamette, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's very cool. Um, so Matt, you, you also wrote, um, in this piece that you shared with me about promises. Um, you promised, in fact, not to waste your students' time. And I think we would all agree to make that promise in the abstract. But what exactly did you mean when you wrote that promise? So I, I tell my students from the very beginning, um, you know, yes, I'm here to teach English. Yes, I'm here to, you know, explore literature and teach you how to write and fix all your grammar mistakes and all of that. But... In the end, we're here to grow as people. In the end, we're here to 
take our humanity to the next level. And in, in that regard, that's kind of what I meant by I'm not here to waste your time. Mm. Um, like I, grades are, to be honest, fairly arbitrary. Like who, who decided that, you know, this, this equates to an A or a B and who decided that, you know, these, these marks on a paper kind of dictate the way we move through school. And so I tell my students, you know, that yes, you know, there will be a grade on the paper and we will be sifting through the items on a rubric and all of that, because it is important to, you know, hold, hold ourselves accountable, um, to, to our learning and, and to move ourselves forward. But at the same time, that's not the end goal of school. Mm -hmm. And if that's the end goal of school, then I ask students to kind of take a step back and, and reframe and reset what their, their purpose is in being here. And, you know, I, I could be the teacher who, you know, just hounds on vocabulary and has, you know, tests after test after test. But really, in the end, what is that doing? And are they going to retain all of that information? Maybe. Or but, maybe not, yeah. Or maybe not, right. But just like how, you know, literature of the diaspora changed the way I view the world, in some small way, I hope that the way I teach and the way that, um, you know, I present what education is and what it could be, you know, I, I hope that kind of changes the way my students view school because... Mm. When I when I started teaching in 2016, I was teaching sixth grade. And so they're about 11, 12 years old. And so they've been going through school for a solid five, six, seven years. School as, as you know, we currently we, know it. We know it, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so th I feel like there's there's this move towards something more human and yet we're still in this system that kind of somewhat isolates the human from the academics. Mm -hmm. So during your years in graduate school, a professor told you, and I quote, the most effective work is the work that has an authentic audience and purpose. What did, what did you take away from that quote? So I remember in school, um, you know, I would, I would write these essays, I would take these tests and I would put a lot of hard work into, into what I wrote and what I did. And then it just kind of ended at the teacher's desk. Um, you know, I, I would spend hours crafting these essays, you know, in MLA format mm. and writing these stories, debating whether or not the comma goes here or there, is this the correct punctuation? And I would turn it in and, I would get a grade on it and I would be happy with my grade on the report card. And there was no real life of my, my work beyond the teacher's desk. Mm. And I, for me, I'm not okay with that. Um, you know, as a teacher, if, if students invest their time in something, I want to make it worthwhile for mm. them. Mm. And so Go ahead. Yeah. So life beyond beyond that moment that that whatever it is that you're working with them on a project, an assignment, that it has a life of its own and that extends beyond the moment where there's some sort of assessment on your part. Mm -hmm. And when I was teaching sixth grade, we read this novel called Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. And it's a it's a wonderful novel. And it really requires students to dig into who they are, their past experiences. And um, one of one of the characters in the novel, Mr. Berkway, is an English teacher, and he asks his students to draw their soul. Not draw a self-portrait, not write a list of things that they think they are, but draw their soul. And I asked my students to interpret that however they wish and to do Mr. Berkeley's assignment. Mm. And throughout, throughout the novel, you know, there are these moments that helped students kind of process some 
things that happened to them in the past or help them look towards a brighter future. And we compiled all of these ideas throughout the novel and we created these portfolios, one for every student. And in the end, we created this Walk to Moons portfolio showcase where we invited family members and, and members of our community to come by and check out these portfolios. We had student speakers and um, short presentations by a variety of students to to vocalize and to present a part of their story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as a class, after we were able to see and hear and kind of process the stories of our classmates, I feel like we grew a lot and we grew together because we're able to realize that we, we share a lot of common stories, whether we tell them or not. We, we share a lot of common stories and common hardships and common triumphs. And I feel like it brought us closer together. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt, you shared a, a Facebook page where you documented this, this public display of storytelling um, with the Two Moons project. And, and I spent a lot of time scrolling through the photos and looking at them really carefully and, and reading the description that you had written for the event on this, this Facebook uh, post. And it's just, it's almost, it's really difficult to somehow explain this to a radio audience. And I was going to ask you about this later in the interview, but we can jump into it now. It's like, it's almost difficult to convey the energy that is jumping off the page or jumping off the screen when you're looking at what was happening at the room. But but let's give you a chance to try to explain that energy. So a week before the showcase, um, actually, I'll, I'll step back maybe three weeks before the showcase, I told students, all right, we're going to have this public display of your work. Give me the best thing that you're proud of. You know, get, present to the public work that you are proud of and feel free to revise anything feel free to make it as best as you can to put your your best foot forward and so there was this flurry of of activity as students you know revise some of their work col colored in some of the pages that they didn't finish coloring in for either their soul drawing or other other various things and um Two weeks before the the showcase, I had students work together in small groups to design, okay, we have this multi-purpose room and we only have a, a certain amount of space. How what what is the best way to present our work so that everybody's portfolios have a chance to be seen? Everybody's stories have a chance to speak to this this audience. And so for about a week and a half, students brainstormed ideas in small groups and, you know, looked online for decorations and really tried to make this experience come alive. What is the best way that we as Room 214 can showcase all of the stories of our classmates? And on the day of... It was kind of chaotic, to be honest, yeah. because, you know, students were blowing up balloons. Students were putting 150 portfolios out on different tables. We're hanging up all of these posters with post-its on them. One poster was our wall of hope where our students, you know, anonymously wrote down what their hopes and dreams for the future are. There was a student or there was a poster of... Um, the wall of bravery, what are some brave things they have done in the past? A wall of regret, what are some things that they have done in the past that they regret? And so we're posting all of these around the multipurpose room and, you know, co conducting or orchestrating this kind of flurry of activity between, I think, 75 students um, volunteered to help set up was quite interesting, mm -hmm. but... The, the energy and the excitement was just there because it's like, I think up until that point, um, 
every you know these public showcases were kind of only in in elementary school there's may day there's um mm -hmm. i don't know may day is the first thing that comes to mind but this to me was one of the first experiences that in middle school that allowed them to showcase their work yeah and that sounds very much like the energy was was really rooted in student ownership of their work and of the process and of the stories that they were sharing and the and the feelings that they were sharing of regret or hope and all of that. It, it's in that ownership that you get um, almost a fusion like energy um, that comes, you know, in a moment like that. Yeah, it was it was extra exciting because the next day was my birthday, and so I was <laughs> feeling I was feeling extra amped because. That, that it was a it was a great birthday present, you know, to be with my students um, after school and to help create this experience with with all of them. And I I hope that into the future, you know, they they remember this experience as a fond memory and as one where they got to tell their story. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that, Matt, not at all. Um, so. Hey everybody, um, let's take a minute to reintroduce today's guest. Matthew Tom is an English language arts and media teacher at Robert Louis Stevenson Middle School here in Honolulu. He is also a doctoral student in educational practice at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So Matt, you also wrote in this piece that you shared with me that you are a teacher who invites your students to challenge you to assess your beliefs and values as you challenge your students to become critical and engaged citizens of the world. So my goodness, Matt, have you realized the extent to which such invitations fly in the face of 130 years of teacher infallibility? Are, are we teachers not popes in the classroom, guardians <laughs> of a canon of church knowledge and practice we must pour judiciously into our kids' heads? Um, kids who are but empty vessels. Like, you are inviting students to challenge you? This this sounds totally like heresy, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts. So, <laughs> so, I remember, you know, my first year teaching, a student, I forget what we were reading, but a student came up to me and was like, Mr., this is boring. Mr., I don't want to read this. And initially, I'm like, Exc I'm thinking, excuse me, this is boring. No, this is exciting you need to read this and it is good for you is what i was thinking but in grad school we were really invited to just slow down and step away step back a little bit before reacting to to analyze why we're feeling this way and to analyze what would be the most responsive way to respond to a situation mm -hmm. and instead of instead of reacting in that way like what what do you mean this is boring no nope, you are going to read this instead i asked them could you explain more and the conversation kind of went from there and initially the student kind of looked at me like what what do you mean could i explain more but I, I invited that student to add, you know to to tell me okay why is it boring why are you feeling this way and and how can we work together to make this more fun mm -hmm. and more exciting and and again this goes back to you know school I promise to not waste my students time if this is not a good use of your time and if this is not engaging you then what would be a better use of our time how, what kinds of things would you like to explore to, to make this a better experience for you? Mm. And, and so, you know, through that conversation, I realized like that, that, that the student didn't see themselves in what we were reading. The student was just completely disconnected from the reading because they were feeling like it didn't, it didn't resonate to their life experiences and that really kind of it one it shook me and two it, it really challenged me to have these conversations with students um 
Yeah, mm-hmm. to have these conversations with students so that they don't feel just like, okay, Mr. Tom said to do it, so I guess I just got to do it. Mm-hmm. Challenge. Mm-hmm. I think what strikes me, Matt, is how incredibly innovative you were in that moment simply by opening up the conversation to the student and what that student was thinking about what they were reading, right? That's innovation. If you were to just simply react as if you were offended and, you know, it was your choice for what to read and, and of course, you you are the infallible one, um, you know, that's one thing. But to be innovative is to open up that question. Um, and that's what really strikes me. I, I, I think it must have felt like that to you, right? Yeah. And, and there's these instances where, you know, for me, this is how my students help me grow as a person to be less defensive, to be less reactive. Another example is when a student um, during, during that same year, my first year teaching, I was teaching both sixth grade English and eighth grade reading workshop. And this student walks into my eighth grade reading workshop and says, oh, mister, you're going to be writing me a lot of referrals this year. And so I asked him, let's start off on a better foot. I've met you for like five seconds and you're going to, you're going to start off with that. At least start off with a handshake and let's, let's go from there. And that immediately to me changed the relationship and it changed the entire school year Mm. because, you know, I could have reacted in the way of like, Oh yeah, well, we'll see about that. Yeah. Have a seat Mm. or, you know, just kind of absorb what he had to say and, kind of make, you know, just make both of us pause. Mm. Why did, you know, let, let's start off on a better foot because we have this whole year together and we might as well make this a really great one. And let, let's start our story a little bit differently. Mm. Yeah, that's so cool, Matt. So, M- Matt, you also wrote in that piece that you shared with me that you, you said, I will allow characters who live on the fringe who live in the margins and in the binding of the books to speak to my students through our critical discussion. What did you mean by that? So in our class, um, we, we always kind of build the, this sense of a safe space. And, you know, it, it's one thing to say like, yes, this is a safe space. We can share anything we want, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But it's another thing to really kind of live it and to, to really create that environment for, um, for students. And it's important for students to see themselves represented in the stories. And there's a difference between like junior high school, intermediate school, and middle school. Middle school is something that's a little bit different than anything else. Um, Going back to that hyphen idea where, um, you know, it's messy. This third space, this, this middle is very, very tumultuous and and gray and and very it's it's a very interesting spot to be in and that's what middle school is it's neither it's neither elementary school nor is it high school it's neither here nor there and it's this process of becoming and it's this process of struggle it's this process of who am i and I want those voices and I want that struggle to be normalized and I want that struggle to be um, to be seen as this is where we are and this is how we can move forward through this struggle together. And so I try to integrate stories from, you know, a variety of topics, a variety of authors and a variety of um, worldviews to help students, you know, bring these characters who they I, they may identify with, I want mm-hmm. their voices to be shared um, so that students can identify one way or another with, mm-hmm. with a character mm-hmm. or with someone else. So um, I want to go a little bit deeper then on the, on the safety and security part um, that you were talking about. You, you wrote um, that sometimes you, you worry that folks are, or I actually, I think that and I worry that folks are paying lip service to the concepts of safety and security in our schools. You know, to them, it means police on campus or random checks of lockers or employing experts from the outside to scare kids into being moral and ethical. So what what promises are you making to your students with regard to safety and security and dialogue and student voice? 
so we start off the year reviewing our our class pledge. My first my second year of teaching, um, we co-created a class pledge, and it's something that we we recited every every day of the school year, and it it kind of walks us through how to be a good person in life and. It, it kind of serves as our guide. And so I, I tell my students, like, we don't have rules in this class, but we do have this this pledge that leads us forward because mm-hmm. rules are very punitive, right? And and I think, like you were saying, extra police on campus or locker checks and all of that, that's very punitive. It treats students as being policed. It treats students as being inherently criminal, which I think is is a very toxic narrative to to put forth and instead by helping students understand okay what is what does it mean to be a good person what does it mean to be a good member of society i think that sets a more positive tone as opposed to here's a list of 50 rules that you need to memorize Mm -hmm. and be sure not to break and so when when we kind of flip that narrative of students being policed to instead students being able to make mistakes, being able to hold themselves accountable to their actions, um, one line in the in the class pledge is we say sorry and we mean it. We change, and that's one that I really kind of focus on in our in our time together in in our class that. Yeah, we can say sorry to each other, but does it really mean anything if we mm-hmm. do the action again? And that's that's how we start to kind of form this um, the sense of safety in class. That Mr. Tom is not going to bust us because we are doing X, Y, and Z. But instead, Mr. Tom is going to have a conversation with us to really dig into what we did, why we did what we did Mm. and how can we make it better? So, so Matt, before we go into the break, can you describe a little bit about how you involved your students in the actual construction of the pledges? In other words, you know, to what extent were they owners of these commitments that they were making to the space and to each other and to you? Mm -hmm. So initially I asked them to brainstorm all of the rules that they've heard in their, in their elementary school and their, in their entire educational Mm -hmm. career thus far. And, you know, we came up with like 800 (laughs) different, different rules. I mean, variations of the same, but not nonetheless, it was several hundred rules. And, and I asked them like, okay, so are you going to memorize these all or like what? What what's the use of this? And they're like, oh, we we just got to do it, right? And I asked them, okay, think of more a more productive way or a more positive way to take these rules that are inherently, you know, negative and punitive, and let let's flip it. What instead of what we should not in, instead of saying all of the things that we should not do, what are the general characteristics of things that we should do or what are the general characteristics of ways we can be good people um and from there we just kind of hashed it out and and brainstormed and word wordsmithed all these different things um but i kind of guided their hand in in one way where one one of my personal philosophies is kind of driven by this Japanese mm-hmm. phrase, okage sama de, which means, which translates to roughly, I am what I am because of you. And so there's, you know, this entire lineage, there's this entire history that sits on my shoulders and sits on the shoulders of every single person. Their individual histories, their in, individual um, pasts, and is what I'm doing right now honorable to that history is what I'm doing right now or is what every single student doing right now is that honorable to their histories and honoring 
their histories. And so I kind of wanted to set mm-hmm. that tone instead of these are rules for the sake of being rules or et cetera, are we doing what is just? Are we doing what is right for ourselves, for our community, and for all of the people who have came before us? You know, you know, Matt, there's so many things about what you've just described that are remarkable. One of those things is actually the language arts part of it. When you talked about wordsmithing these pledges and how much work must have gone into figuring out exactly what the language was going to be. And I mean, it reminds me of, you know, the the founders, uh, the, fa- the, the framers of our Constitution working to get the exact language uh, or the Bill of Rights or any of the state constitutions or things like that, right? I mean, that this is where language really matters. And you involved them in that way, that, where they had ownership of the language itself. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're going to we're going to do a short break here. Hey everyone, stay with us. After this short break, we will come back with more questions for Matthew Tom. This is Guy Kawasaki. If you want to learn how to be a remarkable person, please check out my podcast, Remarkable People. I interview people like Roy Yamaguchi, Margaret Atwood, Jane Goodall, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Pinker, Ariana Huffington, and Steve Wozniak. The point of the podcast is to help you become a little bit more remarkable. To learn more, go to remarkablepeople.com. Thank you. Hawaii's business people and professionals want to support our public high school students across the state, like me, Law Yagovich, a senior at Kuku High School. And Hawaii's teachers and other educators want classroom speakers, curriculum advice, contest judges, mentors, and other support from businesses and nonprofits. The Climb High Bridge is Hawaii Department of Education's official platform to connect the two communities. It's like Match.com, specifically designed to connect businesses and schools. Learn more by sending an email to info at climbhigh.org. That's spelled C-L-I-M-B-H-I dot org. Hi, friends. Toy Hirschman here from the EntreEd Talk podcast. I am super excited to support the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast hosted by none other than the amazing Josh Rapoon. And I also want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible educators in Hawaii who are doing unreal things in the entrepreneurship and design-based thinking spaces. I hope you all subscribe and listen to What School Could Be in Hawaii. And also, hey, why not check out the EntreEd Talk podcast where we interview stellar entrepreneurial educators and entrepreneurs from across the country and globe. I cannot wait to connect with you. Farmers Insurance Hawaii and the Public Schools of Hawaii Foundation are excited to announce the winners of the Education Innovation Teacher Challenge. Tyler Gage of Chiefas Kamakahele Middle School and Wesley Atkins of James Campbell High School are this year's winners, each receiving a $25,000 grant to implement their innovative learning programs. We look forward to seeing their ideas come to life. Farmers Hawaii sends a big mahalo to all teachers for the work they do that extends far beyond the classroom walls. To learn more, visit FarmersHawaii.com slash education innovation. Hey everybody, my name is Josh Rapoon and this is the What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast. Today we are with Matt Tom, a media and language arts teacher at Stevenson Middle School. So Matt, this seems like a great moment to ask you about Ted Dintersmith's film, Most Likely to Succeed, which you told me you found invigorating and inspiring. So what invigorated you and what inspired you? What what actions did you take after seeing the film? So that film really shook me as a as a newer teacher at that time, because it it helped me see like, oh yeah, it it actually reminded me, this is what teaching could be. Teaching is not about giving tests, it's not about giving quizzes, and and this, you know, helping students take their ideas and actualize them, take their, yeah, take their ideas and actualize them and try to present their their stories and their ideas in a different way as opposed to just writing an essay or writing a book report was very refreshing to me because 
during my first and second years teaching, I was just kind of scrambling for for anything and everything because it was just a whole whirlwind of experiences for me. And to be honest, it was very, very overwhelming those first two years um, teaching. And when I when I took a moment to watch the film, it reminded me, oh yeah, this this is why I'm I'm doing what I'm doing. This is what it could be like. And let's shoot for that. And so with the film in mind, that's kind of where I got the idea of to have the the Walk to Moons showcase. Because the students could have easily you know, turned in their portfolios to me. I could have graded it with a rubric and that that would be the end of the story. I would just hand it back to them. Oh, good job. Have a great, have a great rest of the year, you know, or we could create this experience, this public display of student voice. And I feel like that's really what sparked my, my fire that for, for the second half of that school year. Um, yeah, it really helped me just keep on moving forward and not being, not being complacent and not being just okay with where I was in my teaching mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. The public exhibition of learning and most likely is, is, um, is remarkable. Um, when you, when you, and we talked about this earlier, yeah, the, the energy that comes in a moment mm -hmm. like that. And, and I think there were a number of things about that film that really set me on a different path, but the public exhibition itself was one of them. And I, and I realized Matt in my own teaching that I had never done anything like that. Um, at least not with a big group of people in a, in a common space. I had begun to develop a YouTube channel for my classroom before I think anybody was doing that. So I was making some of my students work available to the parents and to the families. Um, so there were, there were elements of that, but, um, when I saw most likely it, it really accelerated my thinking about public um, exhibitions, mm -hmm. which is, which is really cool. So, so Matt, since, since the late 1800s, more than a hundred years, um, education has been a pretty singular pursuit where individuals test themselves against canons of knowledge and move in a pretty competitive way along linear pathways towards places of being from, you know, construction worker to doctor, um, and so I have a, a two-part question for you about this. Um, and we've talked about it a little bit, but I want to dive a little bit deeper. So the, the first question is, you know, describe for me your experience as a student at Iolani School, which is one of our oldest private schools here in Hawaii. To what extent was your pathway lockstep and linear at Iolani? And to what extent did you, did you break out of that linear pathway and out of the lockstep? Iolani was really challenging for me. Um, in, in middle school, I was getting straight A's. I was in all the honors classes. And it wasn't, I wasn't coasting in middle school, but it really did not push me as hard as Iolani did. And I think the one way that... Iolani helped me grow was in English nine when we were asked to present, like do, do these oral interpretations of, of snippets of a novel or um, read a, read a manuscript that we've written. And that, that English nine um, speaking component really helped me find my mm. voice as a presenter. It helped me find my voice as a, speaker and yes it was very very uncomfortable but that was what really has helped me grow as someone who can articulate their thoughts a little bit mm -hmm. better and Iolani really challenged me academically um I was not the highest scoring student and actually that's kind of what made me feel a little bit insecure. My friends are, are lovely and my friends are extremely talented at school. And, and I felt a little bit 
insecure that my my intellect that that what I was being tested on and all of that was not up to par. But my friends also encouraged me along the way. You know, they they helped me out and they they were able to help me see that I have my strengths as well. And one of my strengths that kind of came to being um, in in high school was leadership. So when I I was a part of the Iolani band and the Iolani wind ensemble and the marching band, and through that, um, my friends and and my mentors at that time were really able to help me see that although my strength is not may not necessarily be academics. I do have a strength and a propensity towards leadership and helping people mm. understand where their next step mm. might be. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting, Matt. I I taught at Iolani for four years, um, and you know m my experience uh, at Iolani was just observing the extent to which students followed a pretty singular path, measuring themselves against um, a test or against an assignment or a project. Um, that they had to do, but it was it was quite singular in process. And I, I think one of the innovations that I tried to bring to my work at Iolani was around having kids learn together. So that's the second part to my to my question here is when when you write about your students learning together, and let's put that word in all caps. What do you mean by that? So I'll I'll take it back to to marching band because that's one of the most. That is the the most influential thing in my high school career. Um, our, our band director would tell us, "Okay, this spot in in our in our show needs some reworking, and you need to work it out amongst yourselves." So sections go in your individual sections and work it out, and just being given that freedom to work it out and been been. And to have that trust um, from from our teacher to work it out, figure it out, bounce ideas off of each other, that's what I felt as as a student. I felt very. It was a different experience to just be like, okay, we all see that this is not mm -hmm. working, and I trust you as students to move forward and and figure it out and so by by being given that that sense of trust um and that sense of agency it it just kind of compelled me to work harder mm -hmm. and for my students when i give them my trust when i give them that sense of agency that they as as you know either small groups or pairs etc can work together and work it out um, by by giving them that trust, I feel like it gives them that sense of okay, we have this this large task that may seem insurmountable, but let's move forward together. And Mr. Tom can always we can always go to Mr. Tom for advice, but he's never going to tell us the 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 way the answer right off the bat. He'll he'll prod us with questions, which is probably really irritating to them because you know they 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 might want the the quick and easy answer, but I'm not going to give them that quick and easy answer because, again, what's the point of school? Is the point of school to just get the answer right off the bat, or is the answer or is is the point of school to dig in, have those difficult conversations, have those difficult decisions that need to be made, um, and and how do how do we just grind it out and go mm, go for it which is what real life is all about that's what happens mm -hmm. when you enter the so-called real world is that very process that you're describing um, people don't work uh, alone mostly they actually work together um, so how marvelous is it that you're helping your students prepare for that um, at such an early age um, that's very 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 cool so kind of along the same lines, Matt, you, you are now in an educational doctorate program in professional educational practice, um, which has a leadership component. So here's my question, and it's a big one, um, and feel free to break it into 
chewable sections, if if you like. Um, what does wise school leadership look and sound and feel like? To me, wise school leadership is one that is more listening than doing. Um, in in the in the doctorate program, there there's a quotation that that really sticks out to my mind, or it sticks out in my mind, that a leader should only do the things that only the leader can do, and because if the leader is doing more than that, then that leader is kind of micromanaging. Wow, that's so interesting. And if a, if if a leader is doing less than that, then the leader is not doing enough, and so the leader should only do the things that only that leader can do. Otherwise, have your people do their thing. Put trust in those people because they're professionals. They know what to do. They might seek you out for guidance. They might seek you out for um, assistance. But that, as a school leader, is your job to provide this assistance. Your, your leader, or sorry, your your job is not to micromanage. Your job is to guide and to mentor and to facilitate and put trust in your teachers, put trust in, in the variety of school leaders that, um, that you oversee. And that's where a lot of people will flourish when they have that sense of trust when they have that sense of agency that's where a lot of innovation that's where a lot of good stuff can happen mm. um and and there's another quote that kind of sticks out to me um and and it goes like train people well enough so that they can leave but treat them well enough so that they don't mm, want to. Wow. And that that really struck me because to be honest, I, I'm kind of a well, I'm definitely a softy and I'm a very um I, I reminisce a lot. I, I'm very nostalgic and I I tend to um I'm a very emotional person. And so it's very difficult for me to see students move on past my class because it's like I had such a good time with them. And hopefully I've been able to train them well enough so that they can leave. But the most rewarding thing is when they come back and just say, what's up, Mr. Tom, you know, and go on their merry way, you know. But they always come back. And there, there's this sense of validation that I taught them as best as I could. I, I facilitated their experience as best as I could. Um, and by just saying that, that hello kind of gives me that reassurance that I didn't waste their time, that I helped provide an experience that was worthwhile to them. And I helped provide an experience that stuck with them because if they didn't, if they didn't like the experience, I don't think they would stop by to say hello. Um, or if alumni come back and, you know, visit, if they didn't enjoy that experience, I don't think they would come back to say hi, but even if it's just, you know, one of those sup nods, and, you know, down the yeah. hallway, even that is, is a validating experience mm, for yeah, me. Very much, very much. Wow. So Matt, we've, we've actually come down to the end here. I am astonished at how fast this hour has gone by. Um, I want to end by um, kind of coming back to you, Matt, as the storyteller, which you have been throughout this, this hour, and it's been wonderful um, and give you another chance here at the very end um, to share a particular story, maybe outside the two moons, because you've already described that already, 
um, a particular story that um, you feel really proud about where you were fully present as an educator and that you were in your most creative and innovative and imaginative mode. And out of that came some, some sort of activity or project or assignment that your kids really responded to. There's two. Um, and it's, one of them is less of a particular moment, but instead a culmination of all of these moments. So in my second year of teaching, I started an organization called Stevenson Media Hawaii. And the goal was not to just, you know, give kids cameras and have fun with it, but instead it was to help, um, or, or our responsibility was to help tell the story of our school by way of capturing these events that happen off campus, that happen on campus, and make these talents more accessible to the general student body. So for instance, futsal, um, all of the futsal meets happen in Kaneohe, which for a lot of students is is not accessible for the, for the general student body. And so the responsibility and the charge of Stevenson Media is to go to these different events, capture those events and bring them back to campus so that the stories and the talents can of, of these students can be highlighted and brought back um, and showcased for the general student body to see. And so I started that my second year of teaching and a lot of those students were in my sixth grade English class. And they, they were really brave to put their trust in me because I really did not know what I was doing in terms of photography, in terms of um, leading, a, leading an organization like this. But we spent two years together until they, they graduated from, from Stevenson. And we put together a a video montage, kind of a, a culmination of the past two years, because they helped me really grow as a teacher, helped me grow as um, a leader and as a as a facilitator. And you know, as we as we compiled these these photos, I just cried because I realized that we we did a good job. You know, we it was hard. And there were times where we really did not want to drive all the way to Kapolei to shoot, you know, a particular tournament because it was far, it was hot, and it was on a Sunday. But we, we did a good mm -hmm. job. We were able to capture these stories. We were able to bring them back to our campus. And we were able to help our students feel proud of themselves. And we're able to help our students really kind of hone in on various facets of who they are. And when we're making this video montage at the end, I just had to take a step back and I just sat in my chair and just cried because it all at once, it just kind of hit me, man, we, we did a good job and it, it's only going to get better from here. The first two years were the hardest because we were trying to figure out who we are, who we want to be, and what our responsibility actually is, and if we can really, truly make this come to fruition. And the whole thing was just a very moving experience. An another experience was creating Tusitala. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson's Samoan name is Tusitala, which roughly translates to the teller of mm. tales or the teller of stories. And the goal of this publication that we we produce with student editors every year is to tell the stories of our campus. And that first year um, that it was published, just to see the authors and artists' faces when they saw their work in a mm. book was oh, priceless. You know, ju just to see these these cases and crates full of of publications coming into my classroom and having them crack it open and just look through the books and see their work published. Um, what was just such, I'm getting teary eyed here. You know, it, it was just such a rewarding experience and just to be validated. I feel like that, that, that sense of pride and ownership. And it's like, Hey, I did this. Uh, 
is is just so remarkable and so it, it was those two moments where um everything just kind of made sense and everything just kind of felt good and again we did a good job wow matt that's awesome you you have completely made me want to go back to middle school um and do it all over again and do it with you um and i i am so grateful to you matt for being willing to come on the show today and tell your story and i hope that educators are inspired by the extent to which you um, are a student-driven learning um, person um, and how much you care about your students and how much you want to build trust with your students. So um, we appreciate you and thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much. I am super pleased to note that 41 out of 41 listeners have given our podcast a five-star rating. We appreciate this very much and thank you for the wonderful written reviews. If you love these episodes with remarkable and innovative educators and education leaders, please give us your own rating and write us a review at your favorite podcast store. The What School Could Be in Hawaii podcast is brought to you by Josh Rapoon Productions. Your host is me, Josh Rapoon. My editor, show consultant, and sound engineer is Daniel Galat at DG Sound Creations. Daniel, an amazing musician, created the original theme music heard in these episodes. To learn more about Daniel or to hire him for your next music gig, see our show notes where you will find his Facebook URL and new website URL. The series is funded by education change agent Ted Dittersmith, executive producer of the acclaimed documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, and author of the bestseller What School Could Be. Send your feedback to mltsinhawaii at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at mltsinhawaii. Finally, please like our Most Likely to Succeed in Hawaii Facebook page and YouTube channel. Please stay safe, wear a mask, stay physically distant from one another, and get vaccinated when it is your turn. Most of all, please bring kindness and compassion into the world. The gods only know how much we need both right now. See you soon.